Welcome back to Two Nobodies, everyone. Today it's just the one nobody, Rupesh here. Really excited to be here. And I'm excited for our next guest, Gramps Jeffrey. He contacted us and I'm just excited to spend you know some time with him to talk about his latest book, I Don't Want to Turn Three. He's done a lot of writing and I'm excited to hear about that journey. And we're just going to have a whole conversation about a bunch of things. So Gramps, a pleasure to have you on Two Nobodies. Thank you for making time on a weekend today. Oh, it's my pleasure, even though it's only one nobody. Well, you know, uh, Kyle usually says I'm the foremost nobody, so hopefully I can live up to, to that moniker. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. So, Great. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. You bet. So you're in, uh, you're in Scottsdale, Arizona. How long have you been there? Been here for 27 years, so I feel like a native. Uh, okay. I love it here. It's a great place to live, especially this time of year. It's just absolutely beautiful outside. Is it warm right now? It must be yeah, well, better here than Edmonton. So. It's in the 70s right now. So it's okay. like a perfect time. You know, this is where we have spring training for uh, all the baseball, which hopefully now it just started yes. again. Um, so you get a lot of people from your part of the world and uh, all the states coming down yep. for the big games. Yeah. Are you a baseball fan? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm, uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. There are okay. Two. All right. I grew up a, as a Blue Jays fan. I'm from Toronto originally. So, um, but the Diamondbacks have had some pretty good seasons. I'm not, I haven't been following MLB recently, but uh, do, they, do you know if they have a good team coming up this season? They're going to be okay. They're not going to be the great team of the 2001 World Series. Yes, they're, right. They're, they're right. going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I hopefully when they, I know there are a lot of Albertans that come down to Arizona, it's like, my understanding so i grew up like i said i grew up in toronto ontario a lot of the snowbirds there go to florida yeah. but coming here to edmonton alberta i noticed that a lot of the snowbirds here travel to arizona so uh i don't know if that'll that'll mean one day when i'm a little bit older or sometime sooner but i do want to get to arizona one day it's a great place we welcome you with open arms <laughs> What is what is Scottsdale like in terms of a in terms of a city demographic wise and culture wise? How would you describe it? Oh, it's it's one of the fastest growing cities in America. Uh, okay, it, uh, they we're building like crazy, and cultural wise, it's very sophisticated, and it's got some great areas and a great history. Uh, so when you're when you come down to visit, you've got to come to Old Town Scottsdale. It's the Wild West, and give you a chance oh. to really get a feel for what this is out in the Southwest. That's exciting because I, I heard, I remember when I was following the 2020 election results, they said that Phoenix is a really growing city, one of the fastest growing cities in um, in the United States, but they said Arizona for sure. So that sounds like that extends to Scottsdale as well then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great place to live. I'm not encouraging everybody to move down here because <laughs> I like the way it is, but it is a great right. place to live. Right, right. Well, no, it's good to get to get, uh, it's always, it's always nice to do these remote podcasts and get to know people from different parts of the world. And, um, you know, you're not that far off, but, uh, I just haven't been down to Arizona and, and good to hear what it's like. So, Great. Yeah. um, so I'm looking forward to talking to you about your latest book. I don't want to turn three, but before we get there, I, when I did my research on you, you have an interesting background, my friend. Do you mind maybe just before we get into the book, just kind of sharing with our listeners a bit about yourself? Sure. No problem. My real core life has been in business. I've been in the, the major retail businesses and the, a lot of the major wholesale businesses. And I decided to start a couple of businesses on my own. I, I did one business. I started a chain of hair salons and I built it up to 11. Mm -hmm. I sold those to investors. And then I started another business on the internet, which became the premier business to business site on the internet where we carry hmm. products for small businesses to compete against the big guys. Uh, okay. So what happened was as we were growing this business, because we were really geared towards entrepreneurs and small businesses, um, I was getting these phone calls from our customers. How do we do this? How do we open this? So I decided to write a book. And the book I wrote was The Secrets of Retailing, How to Be Walmart. And so this is a 15 chapter book 
And each chapter is something different. So it starts off with, uh, you know, how to hire people. Another chapter is about where to find your location. Another chapter is how do you find your products. Another chapter is how do you market online? How do you market through the regular channels? And then the last chapter is how do you exit your business? So that was my first real book was The Secrets of Retailing, How to Beat Walmart. And what happened was um, that uh, Arianna Huffington read the book and then uh, asked me to start to contribute to the Huffington Post. So I've written over 100 articles for the Huffington Post, uh, and it's got everything to do with small businesses, entrepreneurship, but a lot of the articles are on nonprofit organizations. Uh, you know, it's about all kinds of things like the homeless and and uh, the elderly and education. And the reason I got involved in that is because in our business, because we are so dominant on the internet, we have thousands and thousands of keywords and phrases that are uh, organically, ranked, organically ranked for the two and three, that when Katrina hit 20 years ago, down in Louisiana and Mississippi, all these churches and schools were looking to help the people and they went online and they found us. So we were sending in all kinds of products like uh, underwear and socks and toothpaste and toothbrushes. And then when they opened up the uh, trailers, we were doing the kitchens and the, the bedrooms and the bathrooms. And so it opened up a whole new world, as you probably will know, when you're an entrepreneur, that you pivot. And we saw that the uh, mm -hmm. nonprofit organizations were underserved as far as finding products because they would come to our site because it was wholesale and closeout products. And, you know, they, uh, we would be able to sell them more products so they could stretch their dollars and help more people. So that's how I got involved in really trying to understand uh, the nonprofit world and how we can help that. And that's why a lot of my articles are about, uh, you know, helping other people. Very interesting. What about the writing? Was that a challenge to kind of get started or because or was that sort of in your wheelhouse? Like, how did that kind of come about to because to start, you know, to write that book? I, I mean, I we, we have had a couple of authors on our show and um, they are kind of first time authors and they walked us through their their process. But I would think it was pro was it a daunting task? Was it kind of easy for you? What was that like? Well, what happened was I really started writing when I was a junior in college, my best friend and I decided to take a backpack trip through Europe for 11 weeks. And so for some reason, I decided to keep a journal. So every night I would write about the people we saw and what we were doing and, and then the whole, you know, not just the, the, the facts, but the, the whole emotional part of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, being on this 11 week journey, you know, sleeping in, uh, youth hostels and then train stations and riding trains from place to place. So I did that and I put the, the journal away. And about 10 years later, my friend called me and says, you got to read this journal. He says, I just read it again. And, and it really is unbelievable. So I guess I always wanted to be a writer, uh, right. uh, but I really didn't. Uh, I went to, you know, graduate from college and did what I was going to do, went into the business world and did all that great stuff first. And if I'm, I was lucky enough to, as I was uh, growing a business, to start my writing career there too. So that's that's how that all evolved. What what about that medium? Do you find just I don't know if it, if you find it if it stands out more for you than other forms of mediums. But what is it about writing that really is compelling to you? Writing is so emotional. Mm -hmm. It can make you cry. It can make you laugh. It can mm -hmm. make you happy. It can make you sad. Uh, and it's very personal. You know, when, when you're in a movie watching uh, theater with, with 100 other people, that's a group experience. But when you're actually reading a book, that's an individual experience. And it gives you a chance to really see what kind of emotions you personally do have without anybody else yeah. seeing them. You know, so so that, that's, that's what I like about writing. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I'm someone who, do you, do you, would you say in your spare time when you're reading, is nonfiction more on your, li in your library or is fiction or is it a mix? It's mostly nonfiction. Um, I love biographies mm. and autobiographies. I love history uh, because those are real right. hard facts and they're also emotional too. Yeah. You know, and they're going to yeah. uh, read about the, these great people in the world, and, and they, they really bring something out in you to challenge yourself to say, what can I do to help other people? And so that's that's what I like about reading. I feel the same way, but although people are pushing me that I need to start reading some fiction because sometimes I'm just 
a little too serious all the time and I have all these sort of real world facts and they're like, you need to kind of just chill out and read a fictional book. And so I'm looking for someone who to, to inspire me to read some fiction. So, but uh, sounds like you and I are along the same pages. When well, you know, um, my children's book, I Don't Want to Turn Three, is a true yeah. story that's kind of okay. Okay. In other words, uh, what happened, the reason I wrote this book is, you know, living this past year because of the pandemic caused by COVID and isolation, except for being able to be with my family, kind of gave me special time to watch and mm -hmm. interact with my grandkids. I got to tell you what a trip that was, because all six of these kids have different kinds of personalities. You know? But the one thing they do have in common is a sense of curiosity and how excited they get when they do accomplish something. So watching them grow year to year and how they interact is really the basis for the book. So it's a true story um, that, that really happened. I don't know if you uh, read the scene. It's called the I Don't yeah. Turn to Three. And yeah. it, it's based on my six. I had all six of my grandkids here for six weeks during COVID uh, before they went back. And what are the ages, sorry, Graham? So those, those they were kids? one to eight. One to eight. eight. Okay. Um, and so the really that's what this whole book is based on is what happened during that time that they were here and all the pictures are pictures that i took and then i sent it to the illustrator to kind of make it cartoonish like um but but it's it's based on a true story but you know it's it, it's something that i think happens in every single family in every part of this world so that's why i feel comfortable about the, the whole story and how it ends what was the reaction of your grandkids when they kind of saw their faces in, in cartoons? Well, well, it's interesting. I had four of them here uh, about two weeks ago. And the oldest one is Olivia, who is, was eight at the time, is now nine. And she mm -hmm. grabbed the book and she took the other three and they went and they hid underneath my desk. And she started reading the book to them again. And I, I was standing aside, they didn't know I was over at the side. And, mm -hmm. and I just heard them as, you know, they were engulfed in the book. And, and Levi says, that's me in the bathtub. And, <laughs> and, and Jackson says, that's me with my dinosaurs. You know, yeah. and so, so it was really fun to see how they could relate to being part of this story. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really cool. What would you say, what are the things that stand out from you from this book in terms of the lessons or the observations that you think people need to take away? Well, the real story behind this book is at what age do we begin to take responsibility for our actions is it three years old is it 13 years old is it 23 years old you know i'm a baby boomer and i got plenty of 63 year olds that still don't take responsibility for their actions you know so so you know and then you know the other part of this book is you know what goes through a parent's mind um, mm. that uh, they are trying so desperate to understand what's going through their toddler's mind. You know, when does a toddler really understand the difference between me and us? So, you know, this, this book kind of helps the family find that out all together. And what would you say is some of the reception that you're getting to this book so far? Well, what's interesting is I'm getting some wonderful reception from grandparents. Okay, because it's a okay. lesson that they can share, you know, because you know, as a baby boomer myself, trying to understand how the world has evolved since I was three years old, you know, it's mm -hmm. also part of the story. You know, my parents, they didn't have cell phones. My parents didn't have the internet. They didn't have cable TV. They didn't have remotes. I mean, I was my dad's remote. He said, son, go change the channel. And I, I was the remote, you know, so. My parents' definition of discipline is just so much quite different than the parents of today. You know, has today's world made for a better place for children to grow up? I mean, I'll let your listeners kind of uh, answer that, uh, that that question, comparing how they were treated as they were growing up to how we're treating our kids today. Was there something that you, uh, where you may have watched your your kids and how they parented, you know, your grandchildren that you're, you're like, oh, that was very different from how I was parented. And I'm not so sure about like, what, what were, were there some tension points in your head where you're like, this doesn't make sense, or uh, I would have done this differently, or, you know, that was actually something that maybe I wish that would have happened for me. You know, let's talk about the evolution of discipline and you know, how parents mm -hmm. treat their kids. You know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. You know, my parents were part of the greatest generation ever. You know, they're the ones that went through the recession together. 
They're the ones that saved the world from uh, World War II, brought back democracy to the to, to the world. You know, they were a very disciplined group. You know, when they came back from the war, they were quite disciplined because of everything they had to go through. You know, and that was reflected in how they raised their kids. It was, it was the, the my way, the highway kind of thing. Yeah. You know, uh, my brother Larry and I, we, we got in trouble during the day, and my mother would say, "Wait till your dad comes home." And my dad would come home and he'd hear the story and he'd take off his belt and he'd keep chasing us around the uh, kitchen table, you know, because we were just not good kids. In fact, you know, he, he also had a paddle and uh, a fraternity paddle that he kept in his bed, mm -hmm. which he obviously, obviously used. So one night in the, in the late fall, we grew up in a small town in Ohio. Uh, my brother and I, when they weren't there, we went into his closet and we took out his paddle. And we took it and we buried it in the leaves, pile of leaves out in the yard, you know. And then it snowed the next night. And so, you know, that spring when we went out there to see if the paddle was still there, it was gone. Right. It was a miracle. <laughs> it was gone. You know, but that was discipline when my generation was growing up. So obviously right. we kind of learned a little bit from that. And, and, you know, we weren't as harsh on our kids. We tried to talk to them more. We tried to, mm. you know, that's how we do it. But in today's world of discipline, I think, I think my kids are doing much better than we ever did because, you know, the, what they do with their kids now is they send them to time out. So you got a two, three, four year old and uh, they're acting up. You know, they send them to the corner. They got to look at the corner. They got to be by themselves, and they're going through timeout. So it's a whole different world of, of, of discipline. I think it's much better. I think it's better than that. In fact, let me give you another example. I uh, was at uh, our granddaughter Olivia's. Uh, I mean, the uh, it was Grace's third birthday. I lives in Texas. We went out there, and so we were in the living room. She was playing with the new trucks that she had gotten for her birthday with her brother was uh, four and a half years old now a year and a whole half older than he is and all of a sudden they started fighting over it and she looks at him and she says to him i need my space actually mm -hmm. it's up walks over to the other side of the couch <laughs> and then he says you know i need my space too and he goes over to the other side now they didn't learn that on the internet and they didn't learn that uh, you know from uh, all the electronic stuff that they're growing mm -hmm. up with. I am sure their mother at one time got so frustrated with them and looked at both of them and said, I need my space, and she walks away. But that's another way to discipline them. And I think yeah. that is all coming together. Uh, so it's a much better world today than when I was growing up. What would you say are the challenges that you notice parents are having to deal with now that, well, I mean, the technology thing you kind of mentioned, but what are beyond the technology what would you say are some challenges that parents are having to deal with now that maybe your parents generation didn't really have to deal with well first of all i think this generation kids that are one to ten years old today mm -hmm. are going to be the greatest generation this world has ever produced hmm. I, I, I i just see that because this is the first generation as soon as they come out of the womb they're understanding electronics they're understanding how to use an iphone they're understanding how to become the internet i mean no i know i didn't know that until i was 40. you know it, 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 these kids this is now all part of their dna so they're way ahead of any other generation as far as understanding that now mm. it's up to us as parents and as grandparents to offset all this great information they're getting because it is it is good with the real life things and experiences. So that's where we have to insert ourselves. You know, and that's why reading books to them is just so important. Getting them, you know, doing things that we may have done when we were kids, it's just so important. And so we as parents and grandparents have got to get involved and get more involved with our kids. So when you say uh, offset with some real life things, what are some examples of that? Well, you know, today, growing up, is a lot different, at least I'm using me as an example. Uh, again, I grew up in a town where my uncle lived up the street, my grandmother was two blocks away, and mm -hmm. we had this whole family thing. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, you know, and again, using me as an example, I'm here in Arizona. I'm lucky to have two of my grandkids here in Arizona, mm -hmm. but I've got two more in Austin, Texas, and I've got two more mm -hmm. in Orlando, Florida. You know, we're so far apart. 
You know, it's very difficult for grandparents today to be the influence that they were a couple of generations ago because they're not in these kids' faces all the time. So you've got to come up with ways to, to, to make sure that you're part of these kids' lives because kids two, three, four, they're not going to pick up the phone and call grandma. That's just, they're so busy doing their own thing that that's not part of their routine. So you got to come up with ways to, what are you going to do to, to be involved in their lives? Now, in my case, again, I had them here for about six weeks, all of them together, to really give me a feel of how they interact. And for some reason, I can't tell you why, but all these kids, two, three, four, five years old, they love dinosaurs. Now, it's like that's their way of introducing each other to each other is start to talk about dinosaurs. It, it just blows my mind. They, you know, these two and three year olds say these big names of these dinosaurs, you know, that, that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, dinosaurs are small, medium, and large. I mean, they know exactly what the names of these dinosaurs mm -hmm. are. They know where, where, whether they eat meat, they know who their friends are. So this whole culture, these kids, they all know about dinosaurs. So, what we decided to do when the four left from Arizona, went back to Texas and Florida, is how can we keep them involved? How can we continue to be a major influence in their daily life? And so what we decided to do is we've got six dinosaurs here at our house. And since the kids were in the house for a while, they understood the house, they understood our yard, we decided that every night we were going to have the dinosaurs do something different. So for instance, one night they were in the refrigerator eating blueberries. The next night they were right. in the sink watching, washing dishes with grandma with soap on their nose. The next night they were playing the piano. The next night they were walking up the steps. So we had 50 different nights of the dinosaurs doing something. So what happened is we were able to become part of the routine of these kids who weren't living near us. You know, they would take their bath, mom and dad would read a little book, and then they would say, what are the dinosaurs doing tonight? So they would call up on my wife's uh, iPhone so we could do Facebook and FaceTime. And, uh, you know, they said, where's Gramps? Where's Gramps? What are the dinosaurs doing tonight? So that gave us a chance to stay in their lives because we weren't living up the street from them. You know, they're all, they're all part over the country. So I am sure your listeners can come up with all kinds of ideas to stay involved in these kids' lives. Because, you know, you only have 18 years with these little kids. And mm -hmm. most times you have lessons again for you know teenagers, they don't want anything to do with you anyway. But so you've got to be able to influence them now and you've got to be part of their life now. Well what so this I know I think this goes into your book, but why why are the role why, why is there such a critical role for a grandparent? Like what like I mean I, I, I grew up so my grandmother lived with, with me until probably about 10 and I certainly benefited from that, but I'm sure not every, like you said, not every family has the luxury of having their grandparents all around, but why is it so critical for grandparents to be a part of their, these kids' lives, especially in those early years? Like what, what real value are you noticing that it serves? Well, let's just talk about reading a book. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. obviously there, uh, I want everybody to read my book, but there's a hundred other great books out there. Okay. And, and everybody has 20 kids books laying around their house someplace. So, so the key is, let's talk about, you know, what are the benefits of reading a book? Again, we're trying to figure out how can we uh, enhance what they're learning on the internet and what they're learning on their iPhones and so forth. Well, you know, kind of picture a grandparent reading a book to a, a grandchild. You know, yeah. it, it only lasts 20 minutes. You know, these books are only 32 pages long, so they don't, they don't last more than 20 minutes. But the, what happens is you've got your little grandchild sitting on your lap, and you are creating a bonding moment. You know, this is a great time for you to spend together, child and grandparents. You know, reading a book is just a bonding time. You know, another mm -hmm. reason you should be reading books to your grandchildren is, you know, it supports listening skills. Now, you and I both know that as we grow older, listening skills are the best skills that we have. Because if we have the right listening skills, then we can communicate, you know, we can teach, we can, we can sell, we can do whatever it takes if we understand listening skills. And so what reading to children during the 20 minutes you have, it helps create these listening skills because it requires them to listen, to kind of focus on things. So, you know, those are things that we can do as a reading book. And another reason we should be reading books to, to, to children is because 
it, it creates cognitive and language development. I mean, there's plenty of words in these books that the, the kids don't understand. Probably grandparents don't understand some of them too, but, but it gives you a chance to, 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 to really kind of focus and teach. And, you know, they're going to see it in the book. They're going to see the picture. They're going to say, oh, wow, because it gives, gives you a chance to really teach them on, on their level of, of you know, how to do the cognitive and the language development. You know, there's a bit of reading to kids just, just helps doing that. And then another reason is attention span. You know, when you're two, three, four years old all day long, you're bouncing all over the place. You got them for 20 minutes. Gives them a chance to have some attention span, some uh, self-discipline, you know, key concentration. So those are all the things that grandparents can do to help influence how their young children are uh, being raised. Did you find that your grandkids, you know, would rather come to you on things than than their parents? Like, is there, do you see that sort of, you know, here's a clear road for a grandparent and, and can probably cut through things that a parent probably can't connect with their kids on? Like you said, like, so if, if in, in the example of listening, I don't know, I just always remember that, you know, when you're, you don't really always want to listen to your parents, but your grandparents, kind of a different voice. But what was your experience? Well, think about, I'm sure you can come up with memories of things that you remember from your grandparents' days, good and bad. But, you know, the, the, there's all kinds of good memories that, that we can create, but there's also bad memories that grandparents mm -hmm. can create. You know, give you an example. I had the, the two here uh, from Arizona. We babysat them because their parents uh, went on an anniversary trip to Vegas for the weekend. And so we had the two of them. And it's uh, Levi, who is six, and uh, Olivia, who is now nine. And we had a great time. I mean, we did everything grandparents are supposed to do. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're here in Arizona, so we went swimming, we went to the park, we went to the museum. You know, we played kickball, we played soccer. Uh, we played Wii on the TV you know, from 20 years ago. And we had these Wii that you can go out and play things on the yeah. TV. We did all those great things the grandparents are supposed to do. Um, then on Saturday night, um, Levi, who's a very picky eater, um, his grandmother said to him, Levi, you have to eat this. And if you don't eat this, you're not going to be able to watch TV that mm. night. And so he says, I'm not going to eat it, so I'm not going to watch TV. Yeah. So we gave the kids back to their parents the next day, uh, you know, the next night. And, and Olivia said, oh, we had a great time. We went to the museum. You know, we went to the park and all that. And the only thing that Levi said to his parents is, Grandma made me eat something I didn't want to eat. And I'm telling you, this kid's going to remember that when he's 30 years old. Um, just like you're going to remember going to the park when you're 30 years old. So we help create those memories with the kids. Now, you know, so the, the question was, did the kids come to us and ask us questions? Mm -hmm. um, well, interestingly enough, uh, last week, Olivia, who again just turned nine, she came to me and she says, Gramps, I got a great idea for a book. I don't want to turn 10. And I said, what do you mean you don't want to turn 10? She says, you know, I got to start worrying about driving. I'm going to have to get behind the wheel. And I said, that's another seven years away. You're nine years old. Why are you worrying about it now? She said, and I got to worry about college. She says, I got to pick oh, a college up. I said, I said You're, that's nine years away. Why are you worrying about it now? So, you know, when you, when you think about it, Almost at every age, because the next book I'm working on is I don't want to turn four. But, you know, at, at every age, you know, Olivia's age, I don't want to turn 10. I mean, there's people, I don't want to turn 30. I don't want to turn 70. I don't want to turn mm. 40. You know, we all have those issues as we're growing up and getting older. Um, so I don't, I don't think she asked her mom and dad about that, but that was, I, I felt honored she came to me. Yeah, that's a... The self-awareness from your grandkids seems quite high. Yeah. You know, going back to the, you're asking about the how grandparents can influence little ones. Yeah. And, you know, it really is, when you think about it, it's necessary for us to teach our children how to think, not what to think. You know, mm -hmm. they grow up and learn how to think. But we need to teach them how to think. Again, mm -hmm. with also electronic stuff they're being influenced on, learning so many things so much quicker than we ever did, we still need to teach them how to think. And so going back to you know, reading a book to a child, how do you teach them how to think? 
Yeah, and so so let let you know let let the child pick out the book. That way, they when you're reading to them at night, let, let let them pick it out so that they have you know they're part of the whole process. And then before you even open up the book, you know, say to them, what do you think is going to happen in this book? You know, they're looking at the cover, they're seeing it. What do you think is going to happen? Again, we've mm-hmm. got to teach them how to think. Then as you're reading the book to them, you know, ask them about who are the characters in this book? You know, what is the setting? Is it, or do you know anybody like this? Or have you been like this? So keep questioning, keep asking them. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we should be reading to them all the time. You know, as, as you're going through the book, does anything sound familiar to you in this book? You know, if it's a fantasy book or a book about a child, let them keep thinking. And then when you're done reading the book, just like we should be doing every night, well, dinner time, ask them how their day went. You know, what was your favorite part of this book? And why was it your favorite part? Again, our role as adults is to, you know, teach children how to think. When you ask those questions of your grandkids, how would you say their answers evolved over time? They got better. In other words, um, there is one question that I wish every family in this world would ask their child every single day. Hmm. And that question is, what did you do today that was nice to someone else? Think about that. You know, in, in my book, you know, the, uh, they're, they're fighting over the toys, they're fighting over the dinosaurs, they're fighting over the dolls. I mean, they're, they're, that's part of the conflict. You know, right. What did you do? that was nice to someone else today you know and at the end of the book they finally share and they finally give everything uh to the homeless kids downtown but it, it's a process so in in that case with these kids you know they finally started to share the dinosaurs they started to share their mm-hmm. trucks you know that's what they did nice to someone today you know but if if we as parents and grandparents would ask our little kids again two, three, four, five, six years old, what did you do nice that was to someone else today? If we ask them that every day, you know, by the end of the week, they're going to say, oh, I got to impress mom and dad. I, got, I better do something nice to, 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 to when at nighttime when they ask me, you know, whether it's helping the old lady across the street or opening a door for someone, it's something nice. But can you imagine, as we were talking about just questioning of kids and having them think on their own, if we can get this whole generation to start answering that question how different this world will be in 20 to 30 years from now. Absolutely. I mean, it, uh, just, yeah, that having that frame of mind every, every day and that it kind of building and building that question into your head and allowing you to operate in that way every, every day is, is huge. And, um, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And, you know, you also probably, I would think, wouldn't want to judge whatever the response is of that kid, right? Because I would think at like two or three, you know, the nice thing could just be that they, I don't know, shared their toast with their dad or something like that. Or, uh, you know, and that answer probably changes as it goes on. So it'd be interesting to kind of document whatever those responses are to that question. Yeah, you know, and what's great about two and three-year-olds is they're so honest. They, they tell you the truth. I mean, you know, when, when I, I was with uh, Grace a couple weeks ago, she looks at me and she says, Gramps, you got a big belly. And I, I said, uh, I said, well, is, is my belly bigger than your dad? She says, oh, yeah, you got a big belly. You know, <laughs> when you're six and eight, you don't talk like that to your grandparents. But they're so honest. So you're absolutely right. You know, you, if we start asking that question, they're going to give us an honest answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Um, you're, you've, you know, based on your background, you, like you said, you led some companies and you obviously have been a parent and a grandparent. What would you say are some similarities between leadership and parenting and grandparenting? Well, the similarities in leadership is a good leader gets everyone involved in the process. In other Mm -hmm. words, it's not authoritarian. It's, it's more of a consensus. And I think if you do that, as you're raising your children and they feel like they're part of the process rather than being told what to do, you know, that, you know, that, that is really going to help raise smarter adults. I love that. Love that. Kyle and I, uh, probably just some context. So Kyle and I started this podcast because we were relatively new dads and we were just wanting an outlet to 
talk about some of our challenges and such. You having, you know, you as a dad and being a grandfather, what would you say are some things that may have come out of this book that may be particular interest for some for the dads out there? Now, the hero in this book is the dad, right? Okay. And, and what happens is, you know, we have all this conflict with the kids in the book. Uh, and he actually called them all together and has them sit into a circle and start to talk about what the conflicts are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a dad, that's what you can do to help your kids, you know, guide them, let them think. Because the solution came up, uh, Olivia came up with the solution. She's the one that said, we need to give all of the toys that we've been fighting over and all the ones we got for presents. We need to give them to the less fortunate homeless downtown. And that was their solution. But that came about because the father gave them that platform to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that's what you want to do as a father. You want to make sure that you're giving your child as many options. And going back to the theme of the teaching children how to think. You know, that's what dads need to do. Teach your child how to think so that they make better decisions as they grow older. Yeah, that's... And, and you know, obviously moms do that too. And just trying to get a handle of sort of why dads would have a... Do you, are, you, are you thinking that dads would have a much bigger impact on that in terms of giving that platform and that space than a mom would have or or is it just more of a necessary thing that a dad just has to do those things a dad has to do those things yeah uh, many times the uh, child is with their mother many more time longer time than they are with the dad the dad has to step yeah. in make sure that they're part of the process the kid sees there's a real partnership here and that's how we're going to raise this family did you have because something i'm going through and i'm talking to some of my friends is that my daughter, she's four, and she's at this place sometimes where she has, doesn't want anything to do with dad. It's always about mom, and I put my best foot forward, and sometimes it hurts, you know, to, to hear that sort of uh, rejection sometimes. And when I talk to some of my friends who have either had kids who have gone through that age or are going through that age, they said that they experienced similar things. But I don't know if you had experienced that or if you see... Um, the dads of your grandkids have gone through those things, but any, any thought about why that happens? Kids come around. In other words, they go through phases. They go through phases where they like mom better than dad. They go through yeah. phases where they like dad or the mom. They go through phases where they don't like either one of them, but like grandma, you know, but they get out of it. You kind of, kind of look at it, you know, my mission really is to get grandparents more involved in raising their kids uh, mm -hmm. again, because you only have 18 years to do this and really less obviously when the kids are teenagers but and and in my generation you know which are the grandparents of today you know we're here today but could be gone tomorrow i mean look how this this pandemic has affected us you know, 16% of the population is 65 years and older, but 75% of the COVID deaths came from my generation. So it's like, you know, we, we're here today, but we're going to be gone tomorrow. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why we won't be here. So we've got to step up. We have to get involved. We got to make sure we're part of uh, helping these kids see the light beyond what's going on on the internet. So, that, but because we may not be here tomorrow. So we've got to make that effort. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I always think that grandparents have this special way of connecting with kids rather than their parents. And um, it is unfortunate for those families who don't necessarily have the same kind of relationships or their grandparents are not around. Uh, but it is it is it is good to see you sort of documenting this and the special place that grandparents have. Um, so, no, I, I thank you for 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 sharing all that. I, I was wondering if we could if we could pivot a bit, and I wanted to get to know. Um, you know, you started talking about uh, some of your past work when it comes to uh, the book that you read that you wrote about um, about beating Walmart, and what a what a no nonsense title that is. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious as to you know it's pretty self explanatory, but it's like uh, you know it it hits right at it. So, do you mind if we pivot to that, or was there was there more you wanted to share about uh, about I don't want to turn three? Well, I just want to leave your listeners with this thought about how why we have to get involved with kids reading. I mean, this yeah. pandemic has caused kids to read a lot less 
I mean, just by because they're not going to school. I mean, according to the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, I think it's called UNESCO, uh, 584 million children worldwide are experiencing reading difficulties. Put that number in your head. You know, they're having trouble reading. That compares to 460 million before the pandemic broke. So that's a 20% increase just from the pandemic that, that we have with, with these kids who just have difficulty reading. That wipes out two decades of educational gains from around the world. Mm -hmm. So we have got to get involved. You know, the Stanford Graduate School of Education he sent a, just a, the republished that second and third graders reading fluency is now 30% behind what it was during a typical year. You know, reading fluency is what you have, learn how to read so that you can use the reading to, to learn how to do math and things like that. You know, that, that's why we all have to focus on this. That's why we all have to, you know, instead of going out one night and having a good time, spend it with the kids. We got to get them there. We got to make up for 20% of what they lost, you know, because of this pandemic. So if I've got any grandparents listening to this, please spend that extra time to get these kids back to where they need to be. That's a, a wonderful message. And I also, I think that with, especially during COVID, it seems like we're all spending more time on screens. And so if you're not reading a book, where's your attention going? And I, and, you know, looking at those screens all day long for those kids, we, there's a lot of research to show that that's not always a good thing. And so that worries me as well. I don't know if that worries you. And I'm not sure if that was the case with your grandkids as far as how much screen time they're, they were focusing on during COVID in particular. But that's uh, certainly I'm con something I'm concerned with for sure. Don't lose sight that you and me and our wives and all of the other adults are role models for these kids. You know, mm. They reflect what we do. So if we're on our screens all day long, your kids are going to be on their screens all day long. You know, I, and you know this because, you know, when, 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 when you're two, three, four years old and you say a cuss word to that kid, I can guarantee you that you're going to hear that same word four more times. That sure. day. You know, and the only way you can really offset that is if you, as soon as you say a cuss word, start giving them things that they like, like bananas and blueberries and dinosaurs. So you follow with that. Hopefully they'll forget it. But, but you are the role model. So, Whatever you do, they're watching and they're going to imitate. So that's why we got to make sure that we do things besides being on our phones all day, uh, because that's what these kids are going to do. I was at uh, I was at a place called the Treehouse here in Edmonton. And essentially, it's like this big jungle gym, and I took my daughter there. And every parent has their phone in their back pocket. <laughs> And their kids are playing around, and the, all the parents. And I'm guilty of this. I can't say that I'm I'm innocent, but you know, it's a, a place where all the kids are running around, and the parents are on their phones. And sometimes, yeah, it does dawn on me, Gramps, that uh, what, when those kids look back out to the parents who are watching them, and they're on their screens, what does that what does that mean for them? They probably think, hey, a phone is an inherent part of life. It is a you know, it's a necessary thing that I need to be able to hold and manage when I get older, or um, that's kind of, kind of scary. And it's not really a good reflection of what life ought to be like. Right. Well, you know, when you think about you are the role model, you've got to make sure that we have to develop the right habits in these kids. And I keep talking about reading because that's what I'm into right now, but, but you know, we, we've got to get them in the habit of reading books. How, mm -hmm. how do they do that? Well, one is the role model. You as a parent have got to read a book with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you spend time reading, they're going to spend time reading, you know, and you got to get them into a bedtime reading routine. You know, they got to take the bath. They got to know every night they got to read a book. They are going to read a book, you know, and you've got to have a special uh, place to, for them to find their books, whether it's in their bedroom, we got a little library of a few books or it's in your, it's in your living room. There's got to be some place where they can identify that there is a place that's part of my reading routine that that's where I'm going to be able to get that, you know? And so it's, you've got to have this special study place or library when, when you do that. Um, and, and you want to make sure that, that you have books that are colorful and attractive. And, uh, and then you want to understand your kid's natural tendency. Do they like you to read the book with them or do they want to read the book by themselves or, you know, you've got to play into that. But again, we're the role models and we've got to develop that. So, that, you know, as we're limiting their screen time, we're giving them something else to replace it 
that is meaningful to their development. Yeah. I want to come back to sort of one thing that uh, I forgot to ask you is when you talked about your granddaughter, Olivia, and she, you said she doesn't want to turn 10, those grandchildren that say they don't want to turn three, what are the, so, you know, it's really interesting that Olivia was saying she's fearful about college and fearful about a few other things, but for the ones that are at that younger age, like three, four, what, do you know what their fears are about or why they don't want to turn three or four or? They're, they're starting, we're giving a responsibility. Okay, now yeah. think about it. When they're in their twos, you know, they pretty much can do anything they want. And then, you know, yeah. once they start to turn two, three, and four, we're holding them accountable. And so that's part of the development. So I think that's uh, that's that's why I came up with the title of this book. Yeah, yeah. Can grandparents do anything to help facilitate that, you know, that added responsibility that some of these kids are feeling? Just be involved with them. Again, we're... Uh, you know, I, I think of my age, I still think of what my grandparents did for me. I'm sure you can come up with stories what your yeah. grandparents did for you, you know? And so we just have to be involved. Well, the, the kids need to know. It takes a it takes a village to raise a mm-hmm. kid today, okay? You know, especially in these single-family homes, single-parent homes where there's only a mom or a dad. You know, it takes uncles and aunts and cousins and friends and grandparents to raise a child today. Uh, just because there's so many outside influences that we all have to get involved in doing that. Your your message about the role of grandparents obviously is coming out really strongly. What about those families who don't necessarily have grandparents? I'm assuming, you know, it's not just about grandparents, but, you know, you, you obviously spoke about some of those generational pieces, but what would you say to those families who don't necessarily have grandparents around at all, whether it be, you know, they're just physically not present um, or, uh, they don't exist or, or they don't have relationships with them at all. Like, what would you say to those families to kind of hopefully so that those kids have the same kind of support as those families that do have grandparents? They need to seek their own village. So in mm-hmm. other words, if you don't have grandparents available just because they're either dead or not even where you are, yeah. then you need to reach out to your friends and you need to reach out to your colleagues because again, the more people that are influencing how a child grows up, the better the child's going to see from different points of view. Because even though we don't think we have the greatest point of view, it may not be the right one every time. So it's it's necessary for parents who do not have you know, grandparents available, reach out to your brothers and your sisters, reach out to your cousins, you know, reach out to your friends in your neighborhood. Uh, reach out, there may be a grandmother down the street who has no grandkids. Get her involved. Uh, but, but we've got to make that effort. That's wonderful. I'm excited to read the book. I, I must admit, I wanted to first talk to you first before I actually dove into the book. So I did that purposely. Uh, where can people find your book? Oh, you find it on uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble, about a hundred other sites, or just come to my site, scrampsjeffrey.com. Or if any of your listeners want to continue the conversation or explore other th- topics, you know, just email me at gramsjeffrey at gmail.com. Um, so please, uh, I'd like to keep the conversation going. Perfect. Well, we'll I'll definitely put that in the show notes. Um, with your with your other book, it's re- it is interesting to me too, and I might want to take a crack at that one too. But what what's the main message out of uh, how to be that the, the book about how to be Walmart? Well, you've got to. Remember that when Walmart was starting up, you know, it was a great place for American and Canadian uh, manufacturers to sell their products. Mm. So, you know, if you take a look at what happened in the 70s, you know, in the 80s, you know, Walmart was creating businesses at all in North America. Uh, You know, there were all these manufacturers that were making stuff to go into the Walmart expansion. Uh, But what happened was, you know, Walmart realized that they can make the same stuff cheaper over in the Orient, China, Philippines, mm-hmm. and things like that. So what happened with North America during the 70s and 80s, this continent is scattered with all of these great manufacturers that put 50 to 60% of their business into Walmart. And then Walmart, all of a sudden, the next year says, I'm going to do it myself. And they put them out of business. Yeah. This whole place, this whole country is scattered with manufacturers that are out of business because of those decisions. You know, and then Walmart went into small town America and it started to put out of business all of the entrepreneurs, mom and pop shops, the yeah. mom and pops. You know, so so 
it's it, that experience you know that's a tough thing that walmart did this to 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 north america uh, and so so that's what the book is is partly about is you know how do you find the niche where do you sell what kind of products you have so you can compete against walmart now what has evolved that wasn't around in the 70s and 80s is the internet mm. today on the internet there are millions and millions of small businesses that are now have the opportunity to sell products through amazon through walmart through etsy through ebay mm. and many many others so it's kind of come around where today may be the best time in the history of, of our countries to be an entrepreneur, to be a small business person. Because in today's world, you know, before in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you know, you had to have a physical shop to sell products. You know, now you can have a physical shop to sell products and you can sell them on the internet. So back in the, uh, before when Walmart was at there, is that you know, building, you know, we could just sell in our own little town. Mm -hmm. Now you can take, you, you can sell all over the world. So it's a whole different world and uh, this is the time for entrepreneurs to step up and say, I'm going to take a chance. I don't know if you have an answer to this, but what kind of disruption excites you within that e-commerce space? And what kind of disruption are you a little bit worried about? Well, what excites me is there are still lots of niches out there that, that people mm -hmm. can take advantage of. You know, niches could be petite sizes, could be large sizes, could be uh, products that, 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 that don't sell well in, in one place, but may sell well around the country. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the beauty of the internet. Uh, you may have something that you sell, you only sell 20 of them in your town, but you take all the little towns of America and uh, Canada, and all of a sudden you've got thousands and thousands of sales. So mm -hmm. you just have to find that one product. Uh, that you can get out and, you know, social media, again, something that just came around in the last few years, can help you do that. So that's that's what's great about business today. Yeah. And of course, I don't know if you heard more about this metaverse and people are buying and selling goods in the metaverse, which is, have you heard about this? Uh, you know, Facebook has obviously has switched their name to Meta. And we're all going to, they're geared towards us all, not all of us, but a lot of us living in a kind of a virtual world and we can buy goods within this virtual world. And I don't know, it's beyond me, but I don't know if you know anything about that, but that's just, it, it, things are evolving like, like madness. <laughs> well, you know, and it's evolved more in the last two years because of COVID. I mean, yeah. all of a sudden it forced all of us to be yeah. at home and yeah. figure out different ways to get what we want. And so that's why this metaverse is going to do well. Yeah. 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 Um, Gramps, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to, uh, we, Kyle and I usually ask our guests a few questions if that's okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's a way for us to just always get to better know everyone. Um, the first question is, uh, dead or alive, who are the five people that you would want to have a meal with? And, you know, if you want to have them individually or together, love to hear your, your spin on that. And Kyle's kind of added a recent, uh, recent one, which is what would, what do you think you'd be eating with these folks? I think the five that I would like to have at the same table at the same time, number one would be Albert Einstein. Mm. Number two would be Goldie Meyer. Mm. Number three would be Abraham Lincoln. Number four would be Martin Luther King. And number five would be Elon Musk. Oh, geez. <laughs> those wow. Are five. Now, you know, what, why, why those five? Well, those, they, they're all compassionate leaders. Mm -hmm. they, they, they all made a difference. You know, they all wanted to make the world a better place. I mean, you know, just look at Elon. I mean, he did PayPal and now he's got us in the space and he's mm. got us in electric cars. Mm. I mean, you know, that's a visionary. You know, and, you know look, look at Goldie Meyer. She uh, really is an example for, I've got three out of my four kids are girls and, you know, I've got granddaughters. She is an example of back, you know, many, many years ago, how women can make a difference, you know, in, in this world. You know, and so look at Martin Luther King. He had a dream. We should all be dreaming. You know, so, so those are the ones I would have. And 
they're the ones that help influence who we are today and hopefully who we're going to be tomorrow. And you'd have these folks together or, or individual conversations? Oh, absolutely. All together. All together. Just being a fly on the wall on that five is, I don't even know what to say. I wouldn't be able Again, to say it, anything. It, it takes a village. They're, yeah. They'd be my village. Yeah. Who do you think dominates that conversation? I think uh, Elon Musk would dominate it. Interesting. Yeah. Again, Interesting. because of all these things, uh, you know, how far he's taken in just the few years he's been here. Mm. So you, you're thinking more from a, a substance standpoint, or you think like vocally he'd be the one who'd be leading the conversation? Yes, I think um, you know, he'd be leading by example. Yeah. That's a, that's a hell of a five. <laughs> um, I wish they could play basketball. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, last question. Beyond the circle of beyond the circle of life, what do you know for sure? Well, we know for sure that there's going to be taxes and there's going to be death. <laughs> yeah, we experience that right away. Right. Um, but you know, the human spirit, as far as I'm concerned, is alive and well. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, not in Ukraine right now, mm -hmm. but the human spirit is alive and well here in North America. Um, and we just got to we just got to keep feeding it and keep growing it, um, and so that's what I know. I, I think I think that even though we're going through all the strife right now, you know, we just we're going through COVID, we're going through war, but when this is all done, I think the human spirit will evolve and will triumph. And again, knowing that this is greatest generation coming up, these one to 10 years old are going to be better than any of us ever were. Mm. Uh, I've got, I think the world is glasses half full. Love it. Gramps, thanks so much for taking the time with our Two Nobody show. We really appreciate having you. I really enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to reading that book. And I'm going to put all of Gramps' info in our show notes, including links to the book and Graham said you could reach out to him to continue the conversation. So I encourage you to do that. Hopefully you enjoyed your time, Gramps, on our show as much as we enjoyed having you. And uh, look forward to uh, connecting in the future. So thanks for your time. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Okay. That's a wrap, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.